Hello, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. Yes, I'm filming from my car again, a uh, busy mom life, and this is when I have a few moments. I owe you all a 40,000 subscriber thank you video. And this is not that video. Uh, the next video, I will take some time to do and ask me anything and answer all of the questions that you all posted, not all of them, a few of them, um, to say thank you for getting this channel to 40,000 subscribers. But I want to make another quick video here first. So permaculture is a design system that has three ethics, earth care, people care, and fair share. And for me, the people care aspect of it is something that keeps coming to the forefront over and over and over again. When I first got into permaculture, you know, I started being interested in it when I was 18. What initially drew me to it was a lot of the environmental aspects, a lot of the earth care aspects a lot of the sustainable food production, you know, like environmentally friendly design and having green living and green architecture. All of that was really, really appealing to me initially. And it took me quite a while um, as a person to go through kind of a, a maturation and growth process, right? Like deconstructing from my, you know, religious upbringing, kind of shifting my worldview, kind of finding that the systems that I had grown up believing in didn't actually support any of the values that I held dear or the ways that the systems that I was participating in um, had kind of hoodwinked me into thinking that they were supporting my values and the people and things I cared about when they weren't. So that was a long growth and maturation process. And during that time, my focus in permaculture was, was very much on that earth care aspect, very much on the food production. But as the years have gone on, more and more, I really see how what we call social permaculture, which is the way that permaculture ethics and principles are applicable to human relationships and the way we organize our communities and our society, how that is just a crucial element. It is the core of permaculture because we can't really grow food. We can't really have sustainable food systems. We can't really enact environmental policies and think about changing the way that we interact with nature without realizing that we do that as human beings interacting with each other to begin with. So social permaculture is something that is really important to me. And for me, it feels like if I am going to authentically and diligently uphold the values of earth care and fair share, I can't do that without deeply investing in people care. So over the last few years, you know, if you've watched my content from the beginning uh, of my YouTube journey or before that, you know, Facebook, that that has become more and more and more the focus of my work the way that permaculture ethics and principles apply to myself as an individual and to my nuclear family, to my extended family, to my neighbors, to my greater community, to my city, to us as human beings inhabiting this planet and beyond that, the way that we interface with future generations that have yet to come, right? So when we look at permaculture zones of living, I think that social permaculture also has those zones radiating out, radiating out from our, our individual selves out to all humanity and the way that we use our understanding of permaculture and the way we dive into the connection between people helps us create those deeper connections and be more successful in our plans to interface sustainably with the environment around us because we are part of the environment, our neighbors are part of the environment, and we all have to work together cohesively to reduce the harm that we uh, put out into the world and to actually have positive change. Okay, so with that waxing a little bit heavy there, I went to a wedding this past weekend and it was wonderful. It was a wedding for a dear friend of mine from Roller Derby. We have seen each other sporadically throughout the pandemic because she and I are in a board game group. We love to play games together. Um, myself, my husband, and both my girls also, uh, you know, are involved in that group. And we went to her wedding. It was wonderful. It was magical. But but let's be real. Like I don't get out very much since 2020. Uh, we have really radically changed the way that our family lives and operates and has a social life. So many of my social interactions now are really limited to like online or on the phone because we're very COVID cautious. You know, I'm very, very concerned about 
the fact that, you know, I, I, we still operate as if we have a bubble, right? And in my bubble includes my sister whose health is, is, you know, of concern. I have my own health issues and I also care very deeply about my friends who are in the greater, you know, out in those like farther circles, right? Zone three, zone four of our human interaction that have ongoing chronic health issues for whom COVID would be a death sentence, for whom COVID would be a highly disabling event, right? Like the pandemic isn't over. And so I know for a lot of people that that folks need to kind of get on with their lives and folks like to engage in magical thinking. And I understand the fatigue that goes with the kind of hypervigilance of being aware that COVID is still circulating and that it has significant lasting cardiovascular, cognitive, um, and, you know, pulmonary impacts for people who, who contract it, right? I get the fatigue. I get no judgment against people who feel like they have to be back to normal as much as possible. All the judgment for capitalism that says the reasons we need to ignore what's really going on are because it hurts the profit margin of corporations, but whatever. So I'm at this wedding um, and it is a rare social event for me to be out in public, right? We go out occasionally. I went to the Dara Williams concert recently with my husband. He got me tickets for Christmas, but like we're masked. I saw some derby friends there actually as well. It feels like everywhere I go, I run into derby friends. Um, saw some derby friends, but it was like limited to, oh my gosh, have you been? Oh, it's so good to see you. Don't you love Dara? Oh, I love Dara. What's your favorite song of hers? Like, boom, concert over. I don't, I don't socialize um, at parties. And it's just such a huge contrast to my life 2019 and previously where I had derby several times a week, right? I was out at the bar multiple times a week. I had after parties every weekend. I had social events with my friends. I had tournaments, you know, I was very, very, very social. And then I also had this other aspect of my social life, which was like homeschool mom social life, right? Like unschooling uh, provided a whole other social outlet. I was like a hyper social person. I also had the Portland Permaculture Guild. We had meetups. There were permaculture mom meetups. There were radical homemaker meetups. Like uh, my social life before the pandemic was intense for me a lot. But for me now, it's basically, it's basically non-existent, right? Like the last large social social gathering I went to was my dad's funeral, right? Like I just don't, I don't do anything. And part of that is just because the phase of life has changed. It's because I realized that I had so much burnout from being so intensely social before. And part of it is because I don't live the same way that I lived before COVID was a reality. So I'm at this wedding. Um, I went with Ruth and my husband and we were the only people there masked. Again, no, like no judgment on my friends who weren't. But for me, like my priority is trying to reduce the um, the risk that that is there for people that I love and care about, including my friends who are at this event. So a bunch of Derby friends were there, friends from Seattle, friends from Portland, folks I had not seen in four years. It was so unbelievably good to see people and to chat with people. And in fact, one of my close friends who I would say was like one of the people in roller derby who made roller derby worth it, even when things about it absolutely sucked. Like this person was just such an important friendship for me and how much he and I have like had very little contact since the pandemic because our lives are just really different now. Not because I think we don't care about each other, but we don't see each other four days a week for Derby. But just to sit and talk with him and like have that friendship fall back into kind of an easy pattern, hear about his life. I feel like I got my batteries charged up. I have been coasting on that conversation from Saturday for the last several days. And like what a wonderful exchange it was to hear from him and just to feel that tremendous love and affection for a friend that like, not that it wasn't there before, but right, like life, life goes on and gets busy and you lose touch with people and like your, your lives just take kind of different directions. But for me, I was thinking like, I didn't even really realize how much I missed him. I didn't even really realize, you know, I had, I had grown used to what life was like without his presence in it. Right. And having the chance to like catch up and chat with him, like I just had a, you know, a delighted grin on my face all Saturday night and Sunday. And 
you know, one of my kids was like, the wedding was really great, wasn't it? Like, you seem like you're really, you're really peppy, like you're really in a good mood. And I was like, yeah, the wedding was wonderful. It was beautiful, wonderful to see my friends get married. It was wonderful to, to like have that kind of joyous celebration. But really I was thinking like, it was great to catch up with friends. And in particular, this one friend. And how important that is for us as humans. Like I can tell myself that I'm just an introvert now and I get a huge amount of my social battery filled by living in a house with five other people, right? And like having my next door neighbor be basically like my brother and being able to chat and talk with him. And even though my social circle is much more limited than it used to be, like how important those relationships are to me. So I can say that I'm much more introverted than I was you know, pre-pandemic. And I can say like, I get my social needs met through my nuclear family in, in many respects. But sitting in and talking with my friend, I realized like, that's just not, that's not true. Like we all need human connection. And I've been reading quite a bit lately about kind of the, the epidemic of loneliness in American society and how we can become complacent and our loneliness can be really normalized. Our lack of meaningful relationships can get normalized for us in a way where we often don't even realize how much we are missing and how badly we need to have that connection, right? Like I didn't realize how much that relationship, how much that friendship brought to my life till it wasn't there. And then how gradually it became normalized for me that like this multiple times a week interaction with a dear friend of mine was just not there anymore. And like, that's just how life is. Right. So I'm still riding the high of getting to see my friends and, uh, I would love to be more social. I'm sure people will have thoughts in the comments about like, Angela, you're probably overly cautious and you should, you know, you should engage in more social activities. Um, and like, whatever, that's a whole other conversation. But the the point I want to make here is that the more I think about social permaculture and I think about like how meaningful that human connection is, what, what does it look like in a reality where we are caring for our most vulnerable and we are not willing to sacrifice our most vulnerable citizens for, you know, like entertainment and parties and get togethers? But also acknowledging at the same time, there's this truth that like we really need each other and we actually don't function best when we're hermits and actually permaculture doesn't function best. Our systems don't function well when we are isolated from each other, right? Like all of our social systems start to break down when we become intensely isolated, when our own mental health is not good, when we don't have robust, strong relationships our growth as human beings gets really stunted when we're not there challenging each other. Like this, this friend over here, like he challenged me a lot to be a better person and you know how important that is for us. So when I'm thinking about like social permaculture and what, what does it look like and what are the key aspects of it? And when I'm looking at, at how that relates to the fact that we have this epidemic of loneliness in American society. We have this real dearth of human connection. We find that our relationships from before 2020 are, you know, sometimes non-existent or have distanced themselves or we've changed as people so that we don't engage in social activities the same way. And we're finding that that we are more splintered and isolated as a culture. Like, what does it look like if we really are committed to building a robust and connected society where we are really committed to like a sustainable future with earth care, people care, fair share, where we are really, you know, seeking to design systems that reduce the harm that we cause to each other and to the planet. And and even beyond that, like if if permaculture is about regeneration, right? it's about healing our relationship with the planet, then we have to heal our relationship with each other. And I think we live in a time where our relationships with each other are really, really badly damaged and they're really wounded, whether intentionally, maliciously or not. Maybe it's just neglect. Maybe it's just deprivation. Maybe it's just, you know, the fact that we haven't been able to feed and nurture the relationships that we already have, but maybe it's also dysfunction within those relationships or the complete absence of them. If we're going to build resilient systems, like what does it look like? And what is the investment? In permaculture, we say obtain a yield, right? 
if the yield that we want to get out of it is the value that it brings to our life and the increase in resilience and the increase in regeneration to you know, our communities into the planet, what is the initial investment that it's going to take? What is the energy input that is required? What is the organizational system? What is the infrastructure and the investment that is required in order to obtain those yields? Um, not to think about it like in too clinical of a terms, but I think it can be helpful to think systematically about like we have an epidemic of loneliness that we have really lost something in the last four years in terms of our ability to connect with each other in terms of meaningful relationships. So I would love your thoughts. I am not like an anthropologist or a sociologist, right? Like my degree is in biology, particularly like avian behavior is like my my focus of study. So um, maybe there's a, a little a little like nubbin to to glean from there because birds are really the birds that I studied are social creatures much like we are and have complex communication and relationships, but not my wheelhouse. So I would love your thoughts. Like, what does it look like in modern society? What does it look like in the face of, you know, changed social dynamics? What does it look like when we know that the average American is lonely, is struggling, is isolated? I've been dabbling on TikTok a little bit and I see all of these posts from people that are like, I'm 30 years old and I have no friends. What am I doing wrong? Or you know, like I'm 42 years old and I don't talk to anybody anymore. I go to work or I telecommute to work and I have no meaningful relationships there. I come home, I'm alone, I'm isolated and I'm very lonely and I don't know how to make friends. Or, you know, my daughter's talking about like Gen Z are very awkward. You know, at college, Ruth is, is very introverted, but she has no problem talking to people face to face. And she's like, Gen Z, don't know how to have conversations face to face anymore. They know how to text. They know how to have like short, sporadic online conversations, but don't really know how to hang out socially and socialize and have deep, meaningful conversations as well as like maybe Gen X, um, like Xennials kind of do. And so what are the skills that we need to develop? What are the systems that need to change? Like, what can we do to alleviate the pain that people have? And, and like see the additional yield and the additional unexpected blossoming that comes out of that, of like enhancing our social, our social infrastructure and enhancing our connectedness to each other in terms of our individual quality of life, but in terms of all of these circles, right? That help, help bring us to resilience, all of these zones of uh, social permaculture that we can strengthen and reinforce and therefore improve our lives, improve the lives of people around us and give us a real chance at designing a more resilient future. So I'm ever hopelessly optimistic. I'm, I know that I can be like a, a little bit idealistic for some people, but I would love, 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 love to hear your thoughts. Cause this is something I have been thinking about as I've just been like coasting on that, like, dang, it was so good to get to talk with friends. And it was so good to just like hear how other people are doing and to have that connection reforged even a little bit and how much I feel like we all need that, whether we know it or not. Cause I didn't really realize I was missing it. Um, yeah, please share your thoughts down below with me and I will be back next time with my 40,000 subscriber Q and A that I have promised y'all, but thank you for listening and um, don't forget to click like and subscribe and I'll see you soon.